Hi, this is Living Rural Radio, and my name is Gita Sidhu Rob. And I am, I want to say your hostess, but I'm not your hostess, I'm your host or something, because it sounds really wrong to say hostess. But as always, we are coming to you today with somebody deeply inspiring. And I have to say, today's guest is somebody that I am, I keep saying when I grow up, I want to be like her because she's so phenomenal. She's so phenomenal. And what I like about utterly phenomenal women is that they still are human. They're phenomenal and they're human. And that makes you, I think, just even more phenomenal on some level. So I'm going to read Vanessa's introduction because it's just so interesting and huge and amazing. So she, Vanessa's one of the UK's most, this is Vanessa Vallali. Let's just, I forgot to say the name. One of the UK's most well-networked women and has done keynotes on various career-related topics for 500 companies worldwide. She's one of the UK's most prominent figures in gender equality and often provides guidance and consultancy to both government and and corporate organizations who want to attract, develop, and retain their female talent. More relevant now than ever before. Vanessa also got an OBE, a very well-deserved OBE, in June 2018 for her services to women and the economy. And she's really, really most famous for launching WeAreTheCity.com, actually, because We Are The City has just grown from place to place. It's 120,000 members. You have resources, conferences, awards, and one of the reasons I actually thought, Vanessa, I'll let you get a word in edgeways in a moment. One of the reasons I thought of interviewing you was because all the events during lockdown have just died. And I saw you put on this one day tech event that looked utterly, insanely fantastic. And I just thought, yes, because you pivoted, you picked it up. And it's one of the hallmarks of successful people, but also successful women being able to kind of pivot and make something out of nothing. Um, you've won about, 10 million awards, women in banking and finance, champion of women, top financial news, top rising star. I mean, this could take us a while. So, so why don't we just Let's say hi, Vanessa, there. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thank you for having me. Oh my God, it's such a pleasure. I'm such a huge fan of yours. And as I said- I couldn't uh, tell. <laughs> <laughs> right? I hit it really well. <laughs> I, um, because I, I do think that, I don't think it's enough to just be a woman doing well for us to go, yay, you're doing so well. That's just not interesting. You actually do well. And I love that. But how has lockdown been for you? How has the whole process of lockdown been? Because being a woman, you're a mother, you're a daughter, you're a, 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 you know, a wife. So, so first of all, on the, on the point about doing well, a lot of that stuff kind of came around, you know, I have a lot of people that help me other phenomenal women that champion me, open up doors of opportunity when I'm not in the room. So I'm not taking away my own credit, but there's a big army of supporters behind everything that kind of I do. And to your point, right, about lockdown. So when it first came, I was, it was an inter international women's week um, when it kind of started to bubble up. I had 15 talks booked. Um, I'd already done about four that week. And literally, you could see it not going the right way. And I remember sending all my staff home. I'm like, I don't like the way this is looking. Everyone go and work from home. This was before lockdown. Um, everyone go and work from home. And, you know, we'll see where this goes. And literally that week, every single one of my talks dropped, 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 dropped. So wow. it, like, it disappeared kind of overnight. So finding myself in lockdown, if I'm completely honest at first, I quite enjoyed being locked down because... Everything was in its box. The kids were at home with me. I knew where they was. It was the family time that, I'd, that I crave when I'm running around the city and, you know, doing talks and seeing clients and running everywhere. So for that, it was a gift to have that time. This, I mean, although obviously it was hugely scary what was going on in the world, people were losing their lives, but I almost felt like we was in our own little concubine. Yeah. You know, and it felt safe. Um, and, and I felt more safe because I had them with me. You know, the, the obviously the challenging part was not seeing my mum, even though she kind of lives up the road. I'm an only child, so I am like her number two. So that bit, and obviously my husband's parents. But for the first couple of weeks, I didn't, I didn't mind. It was like the whole world stopped. It felt a little bit like Christmas, you know, when everything Yes, the time off. Down, you know, every, the emails calmed down and, and you wasn't chomping at the bit to read your emails because, you know, everyone was off in their own little concubines, wherever they were. And so, so that, that part of it was fine. And then I think it was, you know, talking with my team saying, okay, like, what do we do? We're, we're theoretically, you know, under the skin of all the pay it forward and the great stuff we do for women. 
how I pay their wages is through our events and through ticket sales and sponsorship. What, what have we got coming up this year that we could potentially pivot? Um, which led to the tech conference that you alluded to. But the first thing we did was to set up 45, what, what, what's now 45, um, free webinars. I went onto LinkedIn and said, I want to set up a webinar series. Who out of my speaker friends will come and help me pay it forward and give me their time? Where do all of the kind of, you know, the, the marketing side of it, where put it out there to our community? Who can come and help me? And I put that on the Friday and by the Monday, I had 45 emails in my inbox. And those series, I think we're on number 48 now. And those webinars have served 12,000 people globally, all over the world. Love um, it. We did everything in the beginning from anxiety, turning your house into a gym, how to manage with the kids, you know, to work-based skills. And now we're kind of focusing more on the job market because obviously, you know, we're expecting mass redundancies in October. But so that side of it was fine. And then came the- Oh, I'd like to help with that, especially oh, with the-, the you, se Well, really senior women losing their jobs. I, I, that's yeah. what I want to talk about because that's something that is really up coming to us very close, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I found it from, I found it at the beginning. Okay. Everyone's in the same boat. We pulled the conference together, which was incredible in kind of nine weeks, a number of great companies got behind us, give us a bit of money to buy the tool. It just kept us afloat. You know, it, this wasn't the year commercially. It should have been for the business in any sense, but we've survived it. I think it's still early days, but we've survived it. We still delivered amazing kind of training for not just women, but men. You know, we did it for free. We did the conference. We've launched a podcast. So we're just kind of out there just, you know, trying to stay alive really in terms yeah. of business sense. But I did kind of suffer towards the end of it. I think once things started getting back to normal, again, everyone has mental health. I'm no, you know, I'm no exception to that rule where you start to worry about so many different things. You know, you worry about the business, you worry about where the next, you know, will companies still be sponsoring you? You know, is there still D&I budget to do that kind of thing? You know, are we delivering the right things? You know, how I'm paying my staff. And then yes. you add a layer of family, you know, obviously we're a family that cares for elderly parents. So you add that on and then teenage daughters who have their own challenges. So there's lots of stuff you know, that goes on in the background that you have to, to balance. It's almost like two halves. So I found that one of the things that with all the women I've spoken to, <clears throat> and I was actually thinking about writing about this this week, is that their children are really struggling. And yeah. it's sort of, we struggled almost in the beginning because we all as women suddenly found ourselves having to deal with elderly parents, kids, home and people at home and like, whoa, how does this work kind of thing? Because I've still got, because like we didn't close in, in lockdown at all. We just carried on working, trying to not fire people like you. Um, but I, I'm, I'm finding that now what I'm hearing from women again and again is the high level of anxiety the children are struggling with yeah. because they're worrying about the future. They're worrying that they have no hope. They're worrying about where they get jobs from. They're worried, like my son's job disappeared right? Yeah. He just was offered a job. It went, you know, it was in South Korea that that wasn't going to last. So, you know, it's yeah. completely gone. My young, my next one isn't going to university because, you know, loads of people she knows getting COVID from getting, going to university. The younger ones, like they're saying, I may not be able to take my A-levels next year. That's just children's lives. Yeah. Completely well, attacked. In the middle, I've got one doing first year of A-levels. So she's really went back in September. She's had three months and nothing really since. She's back now. The other yeah. one went back to uni, but we saw her schedule last week and she's getting two hours face-to-face -face, uh, tuition a week. So she's up in, in a house that we're paying for, you know, obviously a student yes. loan and everything. So absolutely. And you do, obviously you worry about yourself, but then pr absolute priority is the worries of your children that you're trying to kind of alleviate some of that. So yeah, it's an additional an additional stress. And I think also with teenagers, there's so much pressure in still in terms of social media, their access to the news. I think, you know, I look back, go back to when I was a kid, if something like this went on, there'd be an element of shielding that my mum could have done for me, uh, you know, uh, explaining things in a way that, that was understandable to me as a child. But I think they've got so much access through social media and various other... They know channels. more than we do because they're on yeah, it so much more. Fake news as well. So you have to... Yeah unpick a lot of that we've got the you know we've got the experience to look at something and go well that's never going to happen or that's not true but to a child 
you know, they, they read something like that and they're like, oh my God, you know, there could be, even take yesterday's news around, you know, how many potential cases there could be and how that translates into deaths. Someone who's 16, you know, is looking at that going, oh, is it, would my parents be one of them or who would look after me? So there's, there's so much you have to factor in. So that's... There's so much fear. It. Yeah, and it's still, even now, we've, I think we'll be going backwards and forwards like this for, for a number of... A number of months months and it isn't over even for for us as a business it's like okay we're okay today but i don't know what the next six months looks like because and i need to get back into a venue and start delivering and obviously the virtual market is completely flooded so you're innovating trying to come up with the next big that's thing. what i was going to ask you yeah what skills from your physical events and physical because i don't know if it's as obvious as i think it is what did you find that you continued to pivot and use the same skills and what were skills that you just had to learn so i, I mean from... it, i mean we're all fairly technology au fait right i was a technologist for 25 years so that kind of works i can pick up things quite quickly but it was just the amount of tools that were on the market to help us deliver something virtually you know, for the tech conference, we went for a tool that was in the US, really, really great tool, bunch of entrepreneurs behind it that just didn't have the maturity that we needed, you know, in terms of customer response and yeah. like a fantastic product, just the company needed to grow up a little bit. So kind of just navigating things like that. Generally, liaising with speakers, designing conferences, all the skills that I'd had before anyway, but it was that, but also trying to work out, even yesterday I was on a call, big discussion with our Gender Networks members. And they were saying, you know, everyone's really happy going to virtual. We've been able to engage globally. You know, it's it, that you don't have to use their budgets and stuff like this. But you cannot replace that face-to-face -face relationship, networking, you know, of meeting someone, of, of, of having that moment. Connecting. Connect, you know, and yeah. we can do it like this. I mean, you and I, folks, we know each other, you know, and we're friends and stuff. But, you know, when you're building a relationship for the first time, it is that, it's that physicality that's, yes. that's missing and I don't and you know we were talking again the gender networks members are heads of women's networks across 95 different firms so we you know between us we're running thousands of events but you know they was all saying you know how do we recreate that what's the silver bullet and I actually don't think there is one and it's not a case of oh just we've grown up knowing that we build relationships with a face-to-face -face. and I don't think that you can't build a successful relationship you know without face-to-face -face, but I just think that's the icing on the cake. That's kind of the money shot. And I don't know how you do it virtually. So of all the networking labels and awards I've got, I haven't quite nailed that one yet. Yeah, that's interesting because you do, because I do know like with, with one of my, my children, um, he builds these phenomenal relationships um, globally and they're all online. And I was, I found that really interesting because he's flown a couple of times to meet people. And I was like, what was it like? And he was like, yeah, because I knew them. And I wonder if it's just a different it's mindset. A generational thing. It very yeah. much is a generational thing. I mean, I built the whole conference. Um, I, we had 120 speakers at the tech conference. Wow. And I would say I knew about 40 of those individuals. Um, the rest of them were LinkedIn reach outs. You know, having a conversation, I'd done three weeks where I literally was back to back Zoom for 10 hours a day, talking to these individuals. What would we talk, what would you talk about? Shaping their talks, you know, working out how that fit in the schedule. So for that, I built a huge network off, the, off of my sofa, but I've still got this penchant to want to meet them. I want to make I, the space. Yeah, to because it's so different when you do meet people, when you touch people, it's say hello. It. It's like, it's the glue. You know, that meeting, well, I know, like there's some of them that we worked with over a period of time. And I know if I saw them and we were allowed to, I'd give them a big hug because they yep. gave us their time during that period for free that kept my little business alive. You know, I call it my little business. I was still, still in the habit, but they, they helped us. They threw us a lifeline and, and I owe them a debt for that. You know, and if it's a hug is all that I can give them at the moment. But, you know, I always kind of look for ways of, of, thanking people in different ways, you know, open doors opportunity for them. But, you know, for those individuals, I think if I met them, that, that, that's, the, that's the, the end of no, that I end of the process for me. What did you find that um, you were doing when you were meeting speakers that you hadn't met before? What would, did you find that, um, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Because you were having to, you're, what I'm finding now is that I'm having to build an intimacy online that, yeah 
is really a completely different way of being intimate, but it has to be there for me to create that working relationship with them because people work with people they like to work with, not with yeah, someone else. Right? I think we're selling them the story as well of what we were trying to do. You know, we'd, we'd run the tech conference, only one of the conferences we run, but we'd run it successfully for three years. And we yeah. were the first to go on the tech conferences. There was one before us that was kind of AI based, different platform, but we were the first ones only for women. So it was quite revolutionary. Bear in mind, we started this in, I think the end of March, and we delivered it at the start of July. So it, Insane. you know, our sponsors were like, whoa, this is new, this is different, we'll come along for the ride. But even when I was engaging with these speakers, I was saying, you know, we're a community of 18,000 women on the We Are Tech side. When, when we put this conference on, we're going to give half of our tickets away to women that are out of work or that have lost their job through the pandemic. So there's a massive pay it forward aspect to what we do. So they bought into that story and they wanted to be part of it. This was the first big one that there was. And some of these individuals are like, you know, you talk about role models. They are my absolute role models. You know, the Dame yeah. Wendy Halls, the Sue Blacks of the world. I mean, Sue and a couple of others have happened to be friends now over time because we all kind of work in the same circuit. But they, despite what was going on in their own worlds, despite their own challenges, they came and gave me time. So that Isn't that lovely? Because you can't buy that. that. No, we couldn't. And again, without the companies that got behind us for that conference, I wouldn't have been able to afford the tool. So... so without- I'm just reading what you said here when I asked you the questions and you were talking about um, the men, you, you were saying that mentoring and sponsorship is important. So is that, why do you think, was it because you were authentic and carried on doing it or because you understood what the companies needed or did you give them something they didn't know they needed? Because from everything that I've read, this recession is going to destroy women's lives on such a major level. The women are leaving high profile jobs. They're also at the lower end of the spectrum, the first to get kicked out of jobs because they're the poorer yeah. part. Domestic violence, the third shift yeah. at home. Exactly. It's not good, I wouldn't say it will ruin us, but it's not a good picture, right? It's no. certainly not a good picture for women. It's hard. And also we haven't made massive progress. So to take two steps back is even more painful. So I think, you know, when I was just talking about the conference, those people were exhibiting what I call sponsorship as I said, that opening of doors of opportunity for me when I wasn't in the room of advocating for me, putting my ideas places that I couldn't. Um, a number of those speakers off that conference came from a couple of individuals that said, oh, you need this person. You, and they took the time out to introduce me to them. So it was almost like a cascade. I talked to someone and then that would spiral off into a network of five other people. And then I'd speak to someone else. So that sponsorship of me as an individual and my idea is what made that conference successful. That because I would Okay, have- so so who made you what what do you think made you what is the characteristic that they were standing up for, those people, when they said, Here me, Vanessa? Um, what the, the characteristic, I suppose the fact that you know we wanted to upskill those women in tech, and there's seventeen percent of women in tech. So to your point about women leaving in droves at the moment, that's been happening in the tech industry. I heard another stat yesterday from the ONS. That number's actually gone down. It's like 16%. And the thing is, the girls are not taking STEM subjects at school. And even if they do, they're not choosing STEM careers. So there's a huge issue. There's a pipeline issue. But back to your point about sponsorship and mentorship, there's lots of things that firms can do. You know, I mean, at the moment, I don't think... Even yesterday, again, talking with the Gender Networks members, all of their events have been focused on mental health, anxiety. They've done a total shift from, you know, workplace-based skills to actually what's going on in the world, you know, and how people are feeling, which I couldn't applaud more. because yeah, coping skills. To- yeah, absolutely. They're discussing things that were previously a little bit taboo. And they don't have to seek permission for it either, you know, because it's, it's reactionary to how people are feeling and what they see they need. But... And again, one of the other things that came up, again, I know we're talking about mentorship, but was the amount of, you know, empathy that some of these leaders were exhibiting, knowing that women were doing this third shift at home. You know, they were still doing their jobs, at homeschooling. I'm not saying the guys never did it, but... But, oh my God, it's insane. It just sort of never stops, does it? And work because you're at home all the time, you know, which is, is not, is, is, it's a three job. And then if you add in other things, you know, as I say, with your caring responsibilities or other responsibilities, it's a hard gig. So I think, you know, firms 
seem to be doing the right thing from what I heard yesterday around, you know, mental health programs, giving their employees channels to talk. I do think it will affect women in terms of visibility um, in the office. I mean, don't get me wrong, men are not there, but we know that men just pick up the phone for things. You know, we're, we're, we're wired. We operate differently in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not saying one's wrong or one's right, but. No, but we're different and we should accept that we're different. I do worry about that. So I do think there's this element of senior leaders still need to be keeping their eye out for the women that are perhaps disappearing into the background because they haven't got time to be visible. They're just trucking on with their job and they're balancing everything else. I think, you know, there is still a big case in companies for mentorship. You know, there is schools of thought that, you know, women are over mentored and under sponsored. And I absolutely back that. But I still think there is some mentorship there that needs to be done. Um, but for me, the sponsorship, the advocation is the most, is that a word? Um, is the most... Advocacy. Advocacy, that's it. Could be. Call myself, my tongue tied. Um, that's so important. But the thing is, that's not just in a workplace. We can all do that, Gita, for each other. I, I agree. I can advocate for you. You can advocate for me. You know, half of the growth of the business has been through advocacy. In some and I think women do tend to naturally do that, though, because yeah. that's our version of, of, of old boys' networks. Yeah. Not there all is, women. There is, there, is a, there is a school of thought that other women don't necessarily support other women. I don't really? Do you I find I don't that? hang out with women like that. So Yeah, I no, I find that the women so that have helped me the most. It. Let's be realistic. You do the best. Do Don't you run the other way bloody fast thinking, no. oh my God, I'm never coming near you again. It's not part of my DNA because I, I no. every woman. I want to see, you know, uh, there was a great quote. I'm going to have to remember it that I saw yesterday. Something about, you know, dimming your light. Don't. Uh, is this the Marianne Williamson one? And enabling someone to shine it. But something like that. But, you know, basically just because you're sharing the same space, it was it, along the lines of there's space enough for everybody you know, and that we should rise by lifting others. And I absolutely, that's 100%, you know, my school of thought. But I do think that that pays itself back as well in, in karma, because I think women that help other women are women that are helped by other women. And yeah. women that don't are very clearly, you know, you remember, you clock it and you talk about it and you're like, and you know, you start to learn the women, no matter how good they are at what they're doing, yeah. that are not the women that are going to help you. You know I'm them. quite lucky. I, I live in a world where I have a lot of women that help me. So I, don't, I haven't come across exactly. it that much. Probably more so in my career, my corporate career. You know, I was probably a little bit, and, and probably because we was all a little bit dog eat dog at that particular time. You all remember Because that's time, how we were. Some yeah. Years. Yeah, because you had to survive to survive. It was the queen bee kind of, you know, syndrome. So we always buzzing about. <laughs> but I find that, um, and, and I think that I've, I've realized this recently as well, but in terms of, of crisis, when you're having crisis and tragedy and trauma, and it's a very visible thing, especially when you're in the public eye, I think that that's when you really see who people are. You really see that, that what makes people up, the people that are good in their heart mm -hmm. and the people are like, uh, finished with you, dump, move on. And I look at that and I think, do you think I will ever forget? Never, never forget. Because you could smile and carry on. But, but you have to forgive. Because otherwise, you know, that, that, that builds up a toxicity. Of course, of course. To you. But just that acknowledgement that you know that somebody's done that or behaved in a certain way. You know, but I, I look at my mum, I always used to say, I always used to question how she could just cut someone off. You know, I'm like, yeah, she's very much, that's, maybe that's her generation. If someone's wronged you, that's it, it's gone. You know, whereas I'm kind of more, I acknowledge that they've probably done something wrong, but you have to kind of forgive them. Otherwise, they do more damage with it, that negativity floating around in you. It's true. It's like, um, what, oh, was it Nelson Mandela? Oh, because you want to retaliate, it but it's, it's pointless. It's a waste of your energy. It doesn't gain you anything. Nelson Mandela said that. He said, what was it? Anger and resentment is like drinking poison and hoping it will affect your enemy. And I, I'm a big fan. I agree with that completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I think it, I think you have to forgive them, but I also think it's important to remember what it tells you about people. Yeah, because 
probably because it's still a bit more. You get older. Like another you thing, do. my mum. My mum said one day, Vanessa, you'll get to the point where you will not tolerate. Am I allowed to swear? Um, you yeah. will not tolerate. You can shit. fucking swear all the fucking time, <laughs> frankly. Um, she said you will not tolerate shit. You just get to the point where you just had enough of it, and 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 she's right. She is absolutely right. And now, if there is something that. I, you know, doesn't fall into my school of thought or the energy that I want to be around, it's gone. <laughs> you know, it, you know. But don't you think lockdown exists? Gone, but I'll that. also call it out. You know, that's a thing. And I think, you know, life, I say on the flip side of what we were just discussing, life's too short, right? You have to move on and truck on and do your own thing. The other thing around not tolerating, you know, rubbish is again, to get that out of my system. I'm not happy with that for whatever reason. There you go. Take my opinion. I feel free. I feel renewed. Exactly. You know, how, how many years did I want to say something to someone when I was younger? I think back, even in corporate, where I really wanted to say something and I couldn't because of the repercussions or I'd probably lose my job or something like that. So, you know, and that builds up and builds up and builds up inside you. It's just not healthy. We used to deal a lot with cancer patients um, for years and years, people almost on death's bed. And the one thing that I found again and again and again was that people that got well faster were people that managed resentment, anger, and bitterness better. It's one of the really interesting things. Oh. Um, it's very, very hard. But when you, and especially when bad things have happened to you, it's incredibly yeah. hard. I, you know, there are many times where, I, where when I left my ex-husband and all these terrible things happened and he behaved so badly across the process of our divorce. I remember somebody saying to me at the pinnacle of that, as I sat there homeless with my three children under the age of seven and no money and no food, and he had his Rolex and his chauffeur-driven car. And somebody said, when you can thank him, you'll have really, really gone past this. And I wanted to murder the person who said that, of course, because I was just like, why don't you just go shag yourself while you're at it? But it's true. Right? Yeah. It's, it's so true. It's so true. I look because I think if you hadn't done what you've done, you I would not be here today. today. Yes, no. absolutely. And you know, so I look back in lots of different parts, parts of my life that felt particularly difficult at the time, you know, growing up and, stuff like that. And I wouldn't go back and change a thing, even the painful things, you know, I wouldn't go back and erase it because I would not be the person that I am today without some of those, you know, those situations and having to come back from some of that. I think you've frozen. So it looks like Geeta's frozen, so you're just left with me. So what should we talk about? Um, entrepreneurship, women in corporate. Oh, she's cut off completely. Let's give her a second and she might come back. Hello. Hello. Oh, thank God. Yeah. I was like, that. Are you I, yeah, I, I just literally stopped recording. And I was... because I'm going, oh, hello, just me. What should we talk about? <laughs> no, I couldn't hear any of that. I've actually stopped recording. What were you talking about? And we'll pick it up and I'll have her edited. Can't remember. Okay, let's wind, let's close up then. Um, and just, I'm going to go, I'm going to ask. No, or worst case, she can just take that little bit off and then we can just. She can, exactly. And what I'll do is I'll start with the question on what would you leave women with kind of going forward kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. 